We are uh, excited about our first conversation this morning about Breaking the Hamster Wheel, or titled Breaking the Hamster Wheel, New Incentives for Successful Employment Outcomes. And this morning, you're going to hear two stories from some community employment providers who discovered, I think independently, but almost on parallel paths, that some of the traditional job search and support methods for helping people find and retain jobs were really having the opposite impact on, on what was intended. And so you'll hear about some innovative strategies that they've implemented that have resulted in much more successful long-term placements uh, with the bonus of all being within OOD rates. So what a, what a great add-on to that. Discussing today's topic is Amy Taylor, owner and CEO of You Belong. Her journey has been marked by a profound understanding of the importance of transitional age support, particularly as a mother raising a child with a disability, which has shaped her passion for creating success-oriented oriented frameworks. Um, she has extensive research and experience uh, encompassing all facets of voc rehab, including assessment, discovery services, and crafting personalized plans tailored to individual needs. Page two. Joining Amy is Joe Ketch. Joe is co-founder of Hope Works, formerly a registered nurse in the oncology department, I understand, Joe, shifted gears uh, career-wise several years ago and for the past 11 years has developed an expertise as a program manager and employment support professional, and then eventually co-founded Hope, uh, Hope Works with Jennifer Lando, who is also present today, I think, Jennifer? There's Jennifer. Uh, Joe's a graduate of Cleveland State with a master's in public administration. So without any further introduction, I've obviously talked long enough. Please help me with a warm welcome for both Amy and Joe. Thank you very much. We appreciate you welcoming us and Gosh, what a full room. And I understand that we are hybrid as well. So we will do our best and please flag us down if we get out of you or if there's questions or anything like that that come up. Is everybody sufficiently fed and caffeinated this morning and, and ready to start our conversation? All right. We do have a lot to cover. So we are going to try and move through things as quickly as possible, but do not hesitate to raise your hand, ask questions. Um, both Joe and I are very passionate only about Amy. Only what we Amy. Do. You only can only me. ask her only questions. Me. It's just, I'm the only one. We're really passionate about, about how we do services, and we're really excited about the impact that it has had for both our staff and the participants who are receiving services. And so we want to be able to answer as many questions as possible. If you would like to have a more in depth conversation about that, grab our contact information, grab our cards, schedule an online conversation, schedule a time to come and visit us, ask us to come and visit you. We're more than happy to. Um, and without further ado, this is our agenda for the morning. We're gonna talk a little bit more about our personal backgrounds and how we got to where we are. We're gonna talk a little bit about our scope of service delivery, our model for staffing, and then our core competencies. And what you'll see is that even though we do a lot of things very differently, we have a lot of the same core competencies about why. Right, And a huge thing about having excellent providers is identifying why you're providing service. So thank you so much for the lovely introduction. I didn't write that. I don't know who did, but that was fantastic. <laughs> um, so as he mentioned, I have a background in Master's of Science in Human Development. I'm a certified rehabilitation counselor and a certified vocational evaluator. I'm the owner and CEO of these companies listed here. It includes You Belong, which is who we're here to talk about today. We also have a therapeutic agency, which serves pediatrics from age 3 to 22. And then we have a couple of other agencies as well. And so we are working to spread services from age 3 through the lifespan through our agencies and offering inclusive and supportive services along the way. Joe. Well, I have to follow that. Um, <laughs> I'm, I'm Joseph Ketch. As you heard in the introduction, I um, unfortunately had to write mine, Amy. Um, <laughs> I 
started off in this field, left, went into nursing, loved nursing, um, loved helping people. And when I was deciding to come back, when I was speaking to Jennifer and we had this crazy idea that we thought could work. Um, and I said to myself, you know what? I'm still helping people, but in a different way, you know? Um, and it's very similar. I feel like what we do is very similar to nursing when it comes to coming up with plans, when it comes to looking at our goals, seeing if they have been met, if they haven't been met, we have to go back and reevaluate where we started. Um, all of us in this room probably do the same thing, just in different ways. I guess Amy and I and Jennifer have found different ways to come up with the same ends, but much more successful than in the past, than what we have done in the past. Um, and I'm very excited to be talking with you guys. This is our first time presenting, so we feel like legit now. So <laughs> um, like Amy said, if you have any questions, just please feel free to ask us. So talking a little bit about our scope of service delivery, this is one of the areas where we differ significantly. So Joe, if you would take a few minutes to talk about what services you guys provide and where. Okay, well, we provide um, job search, the JSST we do, of course, we do job development, we do tiered services also with the unit of service. We do summer youth, we do um, career exploration, community-based assessment, we do work assessments um, on the job supports. And we are in 10 different counties, um, going from Huron all the way to Summit. Unlike Amy, we are generalized pretty much in the northeast part of Ohio. Um, we have not come any further as of right now, but we do have plans in the future to do that. Um, we, okay, so what we do is, one of, our, one of our things is, you know, HOPE stands for helping others pursue excellence. And we not only do that and feel that and lead with that with our consumers, but also with our with the people who work with us, okay? We never say anyone works for us. We all work together. And I know that sounds very kumbaya, let's sit around the campfire and sing songs, but it's very true, you know? We are one machine, we are one wheel. And if things don't go smoothly in one part, it's gonna affect another part. So like I tell everyone we work with, I just have more responsibility at the end of the day than you do. That's it. But our goal is to make sure that our consumers are taken care of, that our consumers are meeting their goals, that our consumers are exceeding what they even thought that they could possibly do. Um, what we do with our staff is we establish regular meetings around job seekers, professional schedule, and in a place the job seeker finds accommodating. You know, um, you can't just say, well, we're gonna meet here, we're gonna meet there. A lot of our people, can't get around. They don't, they're not able to get from place to place. And since we don't do transportation, we um, have to find places that are gonna work for them. For a long time, we weren't even allowed to go to their homes. So it was, we're meeting you in libraries, meeting you. I mean, Panera is like my office, you know? I mean, I have one of the SIP cards. So I- Starbucks I, gal. Oh, you're a you, Starbucks you, you gal? I have Panera, I'll keep Starbucks. <laughs> <laughs> I like Starbucks. I like on Panera's internet better. So. Um, but then we do this, we, you know, we create a vocational plan with the job seeker that focuses on what the job seeker wants to do versus their limitations. We don't look at, we, let's just be real. You know, you could have someone come to you and say, I want to be an astronaut. You go, oh, that's great. How's your math? And they go, not too good. I'm like, well, you know, that's going to be a barrier here. Okay. So we never try to yuck someone's yum always encourage, always want people to want to have those ex, want to have those high in the sky goals and dreams. But right now we're dealing with reality. We're dealing with what we can get. We're dealing with our goals. So goals should be very small till they get very large. So let's start with our small goals, get to where we need to be. And then maybe one day, God willing, once we get you a tutor in calculus, you'll be able to be that astronaut. Um, oh, what happened? Could you go back, Amy? Oh, that's okay. That's okay. Um, 
you got to market. You got to market your people, man. You got to, I, I go around, if I see a help wanted sign, I'll stop my car and jump out and be like, hey, what are you guys hiring for? You know, what are you looking for? You got to make those, you got to make those connections with those employers. I mean, it's real easy to sit in front of a computer screen and look at Indeed and look at Gibu and look at Glassdoor and look at all these different places, but we're not teaching our individuals anything. We're teaching them it's okay to sit in front of a screen and that's how you're going to get results. It's not how you get results all the time. You got to, you got to put the work in. Always providing advocacy, always, always, always. Um, always establishing relationships with employers and being present. I'm always present. We are always present with all of our job seekers. They got to know that we're there. They're us. Phones are off. The only time I ever have my phone on is if I know that maybe I have another consumer on a job that may be having a hard time and that I have to make sure that if a job coach calls, I have to be able to answer that call and I need to be able to deal with whatever I'm dealing with. Always address all the concerns of the job seeker, the employer, the essay, the family. We have to be on the same page with all these people. We do. Because as you know, especially the more people that get involved, the more CCing you have to do on your emails. The more people you have to say, okay, well, we want to do this. Well, then this person has to prove and that person has to prove. Everyone has to be on the same page. And sometimes they're on their own page and they're not on the page of the consumer. So we need to make sure that it's about them. This is their life. This is their plan. This is their job. It's no one else's. I tell them all the time, I don't have to go to your job. I don't have to work where you work. I want you to like it. I want you to enjoy it. I want you to want to go to work. And I want it to be something that you're able to do that's going to fit your skills, that's going to fit your abilities. And that's going to help you with your wants and your needs. There's two different things between wants and needs. First, we have to make sure the needs are met and then we can get to the wants. And you always have to listen. Always, always listen. If you're not actively listening and you're not present, you might as well not be there. So taking a look at, at You Belong Services, these are the current list of services related to individuals with developmental-based diagnoses that we currently provide. So, And we do provide all of these services in most cases on a statewide basis. So we do vocational evaluations, vocational consultation, career planning, job development in all of its forms, no matter whether that comes from a Medicaid source, units of service, performance base, their new model that just came out yesterday, day before, um, on the job supports and retention services. We do these both virtually and in person. Our preference is in person. Like HopeWorks, we meet wherever is most convenient. Slightly different than HopeWorks, we actually don't meet in home. And part of the reason that we don't meet in the home is because unless there's a disability-related reason that somebody is looking for home-based work, meeting with us in the community is the perfect opportunity to practice. It's the perfect opportunity to practice transportation and plan for HPC transportation, plan for non-medical transportation, plan for ride share, learn how to use ride share, do all of those types of things because when they get a job, I can't take them to work every day because I can't. have to go to my job every day. Right. Like taxi service, right? Are we going to add another, another thing to the list? And so when we look at that, we want to use our services as a preparation for all aspects of employment. So our staff don't do door-to-door -door transportation because they can't do it for work. They can't do it for doctor's appointments. They can't do it as a long-term solution. So we work comprehensively with the team to say, let's work on it now and get the team members on board now so that when we actually have to do it for a job, we're ready. Because how many times have somebody had an individual that they're working with get a job and not be able to keep it because they can't get there? A ton. It happens all the time. So we use those services as a resource to be able to help plan for that in advance. Is it frustrating? Yeah. Does it take some time? Yeah. But I'd rather them be frustrated with us now than lose an opportunity when the time comes. When we take a look at some of our restricted area services, travel training is quite honestly dependent on whether or not there's travel options available. Our rural counties don't have a lot of travel options available. And so in those cases, travel training is kind of a moot point. Um, when we do community-based work adjustment, community-based assessments, and pre-employment and transition services, we do these in areas where they're highly requested. 
right? So we're doing these in the areas of Toledo, Cleveland, Youngstown, and Columbus at the moment. So if you work in one of those areas, that could be an option for you. If you're not in one of those areas and you want it to be an option for you, we can always take a look at that. When we do pre-employment and transition services, we start those services as expected at age 14, and we embed our staff as full-time employees within the school. So they have a school badge, they're our employees, they work full-time in the school district, and we have eight employees who work full-time within school districts doing nothing but pre-ets from 7.30 to 2.30 during the academic day. And they operate those services just like OT, PT, and speech for pull-out resources as part of their transition plan. When we look at where our staff are currently located, we have staff located physically in Defiance, Lorain County, all of Greater Cleveland, all of Greater Youngstown, Greater Columbus, Athens in the Southeast, and then Defiance as well. So we have staff spread out throughout the entire state. While we do have a brick and mortar building for my office um, as of about 30 days ago, <laughs> none of our staff are expected to physically ever appear in a building ever. If their butt is in a seat, it means they're not out in the community connecting with businesses, doing the things that they need to do, meeting with individuals in the community. And if I see them, the people who need to be seeing them aren't. And so our staff operate completely remotely. Let's talk a little bit about your model and how you hire staff, how you work with staff, how you incentivize them to stay and be amazing. Well, our staff, first of all, I am very proud. We are very proud of our retention. We have, we are three and a half years old now. And I would say, Jen, what, 75% of our staff are still with us? Oh, that's true. Yeah. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So our, our people stay, our people stay. Um, I feel like one of the reasons is there's two schools of thought on education. One is that you have to have an education. You have to have a bachelor's or you have to have a master's preferred. Okay. Do I believe that's helpful? Absolutely. But when someone comes to me and says, oh, I have a BA in psychology. And I go, oh, I'm not going to expect you to be telling me about these theories and have all of this extensive knowledge. I know you took psychology classes. I know a big part of your major was psychology, but you're not going to be counseling. You're not going to be doing anything like that. So what you're telling me is you know how to read, write, communicate, and you can stick with something for four years. Does that make you a professional? No. No. I know lots of people with college degrees that are not. So we value experience and passion. You have to have a passion for this. Who here got into this field because they want to become a millionaire? Raise your hand. No one? Come on. That's a really big relief because if you did, we might need to talk a little. Exactly. This isn't the tech industry, okay? No one gets in this industry to be a millionaire. You get in it to it because you're passionate. Some of us just fall into it. It's an accident. So what happened to me? You know, I was going through my master's degree. I was waiting tables at IHOP. And one of my regulars was, her father was the CFO of a nonprofit downtown. And so she said, are you sick of this? I said, oh my God, yes, I hate this. And so she was like, send me your resume. And that's how I fell into this. And I fell in love with it. You know, I have a younger brother who has um, cognitive difficulties and I see the struggle that he goes through as much as I would love to help him. I can't because I don't want anyone else. I can't mix that. No one in my company can work with him. Amy could work with him. I can't because I don't want other consumers to say he's getting preferential treatment. You know, we have to keep ourselves above board. We have to keep those ethics and one of the things that I think is really great that we didn't talk about beforehand is that when my daughter is of age to receive services, agencies do need to work together and they need to collaborate and partner together in order to meet the comprehensive need because my daughter cannot be served by our agency. Absolutely. And I will be knocking on your door when the time comes to be looking for work. And I will be giving Joe and Jen a call because we need multiple, many, many amazing providers who are of like mind and shared vision to be able to meet the need. No one agency will ever 
ever be able to meet all of the need of every individual within our state or any state. And so collaboration is key and providers need to be able to play well in the sandbox together. I absolutely agree. There's enough pieces of the pie. The pie is very large, you know, so. And there's always more pie to be made. <laughs> absolutely. Um, we, like I said, so we don't say you have to have that bachelor's, you have to have that master's. We look at passion, we look at experience and we bring people in. We are all about continuous improvement. We provide mentors to people. Um, our job coaches, of course, they do all of the required things that they need to do through DODD. And we also offer them, they have training for at least a week. Do you need more? You get more training. We mentor them. We, with our new job developers, meet with them. Bi-weekly, they get met with talking about their caseload. What do they need help with? The agency I came from before this, you'd go into the Monday meeting and the question was, how much are you billing out this week? No, do you need help with anything? You having a hard time with your case? You have anyone that you're just having such a difficult time with? None of that was the question. It was all about how much you make it. I understand you have to have money to keep the doors open, but it's not what we're talking about here. You know, you have, these are people. These are their wants. These are their needs. We're there to help them and they should be the priority. You got to find a ways to make money. You got to find ways to make it work, okay? Um, we empower staff to make professional decisions. I do not want any of our staff to go, oh, I don't know what I should do. Should I call Jen? Should I call Joe? I don't know. I, we empower them, make, make those decisions as long as they behoove the consumer, make those decisions. Do it, ask for forgiveness later, you know? Um, we, recognize their, we recognize their work. Um, we have, for our job developers, we have a bonus structure. Um, we start off at 50K for our job developers, and then depending on how much they make in a quarter, they bonus off that. The lowest bonus they could possibly make is $5,000 they can make up to 15% of whatever their overage is after they cover themselves. We have a job developer that makes more money than I do. And Jennifer makes yearly, you know, but because she is, and she does this because she loves it and the passion comes through and the passion gets those results. And I know that everyone is not money motivated, but it's always nice to be able to say, you know what? I can get my kid this, or I can finally take my kid there. Because what I'm doing, the passion I'm doing, and the help I'm helping other people get is going to help me in the end. We always promote from within. Three of our job developers are former consumers. No, two are former consumers. We worked with them. We saw potential, and then they start off at job coaches. And they worked, and they worked. They showed their worth. We promoted them. And they're two of our best that we have. And one of our, and another one of our job developers was a job coach who elevated and became a job developer. So we always promote from within. It's so rude. I feel when you work for an agency or when you're working with an agency and you know, there's an opening for something and someone you've never even met walks in. It's rude, especially if you are able to be promoted and you have that passion and you can do what needs to be done. Loyalty. That's what it's all about. And an open door policy. You can come in and tell me anything. Tell them, I'm an adult. I tell this to my consumers too. I'm an adult. If something's not working for you. Talk to me. Tell me about it because we need to change things. I'm not going to treat you any differently. I'm not going to talk bad about you. I'm not going to do anything like that. I want you to be able to talk to me. I want you to trust me enough to talk to me about things. And if our employees have a problem with something, the people that, that work with us, they come to us and they talk to us. We make things work. You have to show, it's, it's nice to say, tell your staff, oh yeah, oh, we really appreciate you. You can say that, but you gotta show it too. You know, you can only tell someone something for so long before you don't show things. You know, 
our people get bonuses every Christmas. We do an annual Christmas party. They get their bonuses. They get their gifts. And then, you know, they have to sit through six hours of training for it, but that's okay. <laughs> Incentives, right? Incentives. It's an incentive to be there. Exactly. So, I mean, for us, it's just, we treat the people that work with us the way we want to be treated. We show people that we respect them. We work with them. We had a job developer who recently came to us and said, I've got so much going on right now. We were like, what do you need from us? We made changes to things. We took people, redistributed parts of the caseload just so they would be able to stay with us, focus on what they needed to do. And then when they're ready, they'll come back because we appreciate that. We see the passion that this person has and they're, they're absolutely fabulous. So why would we want to let something like that go? You know, make adjustments, make adjustments. So there's a lot that's very similar. One of the things that's very different about You Belong is that we do require the educational background. And I don't disagree with Joe that you can work your way through, but we have some different services that require a slightly different skill set. And so for us, those evaluative pieces require a different kind of educational background. And I don't yeah, We don't disagree. do those, the, yeah. like the voc, the, the voc, yeah. And so we do require for all of our staff to have some form of either a related education or comparable background in order to be providing service delivery. And it's not just related background in human services, it's specific to the type of service that they're providing. So if somebody's gonna apply, for example, for an evaluator position, they have to have done evaluations or they have to have the educational background comparable to providing evaluations. Um, when folks do those more specific and advanced roles, we want them to do it with confidence. We want them to do it with so much confidence that they know that they're capable of making those decisions without feeling like there's going to be fear of retribution, right? We want them to be so empowered that they don't need us to ask, right? They don't need us to ask, are you sure, right? We want them to be sure. Right? And we want them to have the foundation to not only go in knowing that they're going to rock it, but exude that same confidence and exude that same experience to the individual they're working with and to their team, because they are capable. We wouldn't have hired them if we didn't believe that they were. Okay. And one of our number one rules, we can teach anybody how to do the job, right? We can teach you how to do the reports and fill in the blanks and make sure everything that's green has its text in it, all that kind of stuff, right? We can teach you how to do that right? I can't teach you how to be the right kind of person, right? I can't teach you to be the kind of person that someday I'm going to want my daughter to work with, right? Or the kind of person that I'm going to be okay leaving her with at a day program, right? Or a Vogue program. I can't, I can't teach you to be the right kind of person, but I can see that you've done the work. And so that for us does make a difference. We do professional development. We have faith in their professional decision-making. All of that is the same right? The thing that we tell people is that we don't want to micromanage you, right? How many of you have ever, if your boss is sitting next to you, don't raise your hand. How many of you have ever felt micromanaged either in your current job or a previous job? Current job. <laughs> well, that might be a you thing. <laughs> but if that's true of you, how stifling is that? How does that impact your confidence, right? If, you, if your employer doesn't trust you to make the right decision, why are you there? right? So we want to empower ourselves and our staff to know that they have the capability to make those professional decisions. One thing that is very different about our agency from HopeWorks is that we choose a pick how you're paid model, right? So our staff can choose when they're onboarded to be full-time, part-time, or contractor. Some people are like, contractor, what is that? This is an IT not headhunters, right? I don't work in healthcare services. What is a contractor? For us, a contractor is a percentage based. And if any of you are familiar, and I hope most of you are familiar with the rates from either Medicaid, local funding, or OOD, we offer up to 75% of the original rate, right? So for example, if you're a vocational evaluator, that give or take is a $1,000 service. 
for us and our model, it takes collectively about seven hours. Someone can make $700 in seven hours. Why would they say no, right? That's great money. How many of us would love to work two days a week? Three days a week, right? Can you make 1400 bucks or 2100 bucks in two or three days? Right, so we offer a contract model because we believe in their professional decision making, they have the educational background and they're capable of doing that work at a level that I believe that I would want them to do it, not only for me, but for my kid too. That's the type of, of environment that we set and we believe them, right? How many of us have felt like you're walking on eggshells when you go to work and you're like, oh, I gotta prove my worth. I gotta make sure that they're showing me that I can earn my paycheck and I'm going here and I'm going there and I gotta look busy and I gotta do this. Do what needs to be done. Go be amazing. Let me give you the tools to be amazing and get the heck out of the way. And then I can stand beside you and with you and celebrate and watch you do amazing things. Not just for yourself and your family, but the individuals that you're serving, whether they're kids or adults, doesn't matter. Because you're knocking it out of the park for all the right reasons. Our contractors, like Joe, Joe said with his incentives, are our highest paid contractor, and our caseloads cap at 15 people. Our highest paid contractor holding close to 95,000. That is incredible in the human service field. That's incredible if you're in executive leadership, if you're in management, that's an incredible salary, right? On average, right? That's the extreme case. On average, our contractors clear easy, 65 to 75. Most of them work four days a week, okay? Work-life balance is there. Money is there and money talks, right? How many of you wish you had more money for your consumers? I hope everybody raises their hand, man, <laughs> right? How many of us wish we had more money for our home in our pocket for retirement? I need money, Thank you. right? <laughs> money talks and it makes a difference. It's not this imaginary carrot that's dangling in front of you that you have to, to be a puppet for. You're paid because you're worth it not because of what you built. You're paid because you have potential to do great things. That's the piece that matters, right? The extra incentives, the bonuses, all of those types of things happen when you go above and beyond being amazing. But you're amazing to start with and you should be paid for that. Our salary employees, because I do acknowledge that not everybody likes the idea of like super flexible income, right? Some of us need a little bit more predictability, myself included, right? Some of us prefer salary-based. We're on the same page that most of our staff start at 50K, nothing less, okay? The sustainable living wage in Ohio is no less than 1849-ish an hour in a two-income generating household, okay? If your agency or your company is working with agencies that employ anything less than that, you're creating a system of poverty, right? Where unless you have multiple incomes generated in your home, your staff who you're asking to do the most important work, the most meaningful work, can't do the things that they need to do for their family, right? And all you have to do is say, I'm not gonna do it that way anymore. We're not gonna do it that way. We're gonna make sure that we take care of our staff so that they can take care of the people that they serve. When our staff choose the salary-based model, we pay 80% of their medical coverage. They can opt in for uh, dental, life, uh, vision, all of those types of things, retirement, all of that kind of thing. They can choose to do that if they want to. Not a requirement. They can opt to enroll family members, children, spouses, whatever the case is, and we don't care if they have other options for insurance. How many of us are in the scenario where you're like you get to your insurance enrollment and you're like, okay, I have insurance through my company. My husband has insurance through his company. He can't be on mine because he has an option for his. And it's so confusing and so frustrating. With our agency, we say, if you need insurance, want insurance with us? Yes. Easy answer. Yes. 
We offer automatically from the day one that they start four weeks of PTO time. We only ask, the only caveat to that is that we say, please don't take it in December and July all at once <laughs> because that makes it really hard to plan, right? But in all reality, if somebody said, I would really like to take a four week cruise in December, we would say, okay. Okay. We do flexible scheduling. If somebody performs at their best from say, I don't know, 10 a.m. to 6 p.m., work 10 a.m. to 6 p.m. as your core hours. I am toast after like three o'clock. Don't ask me to make any important decisions. Don't ask me to do anything that requires like evening meetings because I am not at my best then. If you want to meet at seven for coffee, I'm on it, right? If you want to meet at 5.30 in the morning, answer is yes, right? I'm a morning person through and through. So they can set their schedule in a time that works best for them and their caseload. I would not assign myself a caseload for somebody who wants to meet at six o'clock at night. Not the best person for that, and that's okay. We reduce overhead substantially by having no employee who doesn't do some form of revenue generating service. And I know you guys do the same thing, mm -hmm. even though I know you didn't mention it, you guys do the same yeah, thing do. too. Mm -hmm. So Joe does direct service, Jen does direct service, I do direct service. And so much so that we all cover our own salaries. So we're not any different than any of our staff. And that's the big difference between working for someone and working with, with someone. I want to stand beside my employees, not in front of them, not behind them. I want to stand with them. And like I said, Amy, like I tell people all the time, at the end of the day, I just have more responsibilities. Right. And I tell everybody too, they say, well, if you decide to leave, this is all going to fall apart. I said, if you will decide to leave, I don't have a job either. It truly is with. We both need each other. So our next area is just talking a little bit about our areas of focus. And, and part of this is more about the philosophy of how we, how and why we do things. And, and in this area, I feel like we're probably more aligned than we are different. Absolutely, so, yeah. um, we'll kind of jump in, but one of the things that I think is really difficult when we're talking about county board specific cases is historically, there's been this idea that once someone gets in and starts services, they're there getting services forever forever and ever and ever, right? And it might be weekly check-ins, it might be monthly check-ins, but the idea of saying, you have this, call us if you need us, is really hard to do. And I acknowledge that that's really hard to do. But when we talk about true inclusion, true independence, this is the number one thing. You can always come back because services in our world are like businesses and they're like buses. They will come around again. I see your question, just one second. Um, there's always gonna be another opportunity to re-engage. There's no limit to how many times you can apply for OOD services. There's no limit to how many times you can reach out to your SSA. There's no limit to how many times you can ask for assistance. It's okay. It's okay to try, okay? Um, here, I'm gonna come back to you so that you can because I know we've got folks on. Yeah. Um, the service is being covered. Yeah. Co okay. Sorry. Oh, well, it really depends. I mean, you can either have, you can have um, local funds, you can have OOD funds, you can have Medicaid funds, like if they're on a waiver, those are how the services would be covered. Um, we are both, I believe, both um, referral-based businesses. We are. Yeah, so you can't just come off the street or we had people all the time. I'm sure people ask you like, oh my gosh, well, my brother or my uncle or my friend or such and such, you know, can you help them? Well, do they work with OOD? Are they with the county board? Um, you know, we have to make sure that they are with someone so they are getting these services that are referred to us. So that's, that's, how, that's how those services are paid. Correct. And one of the things that I, I don't want to speak for you, but I do think that we both do. If someone calls us and said, I just want to pay out of pocket, we're like, wait a minute, but why? 
right? What? There's all these services that are available to you that you have access to. And we just go through the process. We help people do applications. We contact them with the local counselor, the local office. We call the SSA office with them. We contact the county board. We contact jobs and family services. We'll call social security with them. Um, we'll sit down and we've done referrals from things like um, SSA judicial hearings and things like that to help them engage and get the funding because it shouldn't come out of their pocket. Funding's there. We want to let them use it. The other thing that I do, I don't know if you guys do, but we will also encourage them to exhaust all options for OOD funding before they use their waiver. I'm seeing a lot of heads nod, and there, I'm seeing some kind of confused faces too. The reason that we do that is because the waiver services, one, cover more right? If somebody needs HPC and they're using some of the funds on their max fund benefit for job development services, I want them to use it for HPC. Let OOD pay for job development. Let OOD pay for job coaching and transportation. Let them do it because then you have funds available for longer term support, for home care, for on the job supports, whether it's for grooming and hygiene needs, for transportation, for any of those kinds of things. So we're not for lack of a better word, wasting their waiver funds on things that could be provided by other funding. It's all federal funds. We just got to make sure we're pulling it from the right bucket. Yeah, we, we do the same thing. So let's talk a little bit about kind of how Hope Works sets up their foundation and their services all right. when they get started. Well, the first thing we do, you know, everyone does the intake. Um, during an intake, we, I believe myself and everyone else included that does this um we it's the time to set that foundation i do not meet with my consumers in dress clothes we don't either because a lot of our consumers already feel inferior and i'm not walking in in a suit or a tie and a collared shirt for them to look at me and think Oh, who does he think he is? Waving no. the flag of here's a service provider. Exactly. Exact, like, here I am. Oh, yes, I'm over here. You need social services. Yes, right here. You know, no, I'm not doing that. It establishes, it helps to establish trust. And especially if you're working with someone who has a history of coming back through the system, you know, we need to figure out why are they still coming through? What is the issue? We need to fix what's going on now. And one of those things is establishing trust because when someone trusts you, they're going to tell you things when you ask and they're going to be honest with you. And appearance. you got to let them know that this is a no judgment zone. Right. I was going to say appearance builds rapport mm -hmm. and we're very candid. And this, this happens a lot with students, especially in the school setting. Oh, yeah. We sit down and we say, I'm not your mom. I'm not your teacher. I'm not your guidance counselor. I'm not your principal. I don't have anything to do with your future other than helping you find the thing that works for you, right? So when I go to meet with a student in a school, what do I wear? Tennis shoes, jeans, and a hoodie, right? I had to look for clothes for today. <laughs> <laughs> so did I. <laughs> oh, good. Okay. Oh, my God, I'm, I'm not the only one. <laughs> And the reason for that is, is because we're not in a position of authority. We're there to be a guiding light and an assistance. We're not there to make them feel bad. We're not there to make it harder than it already is. So why on earth would we set that precedence from the moment we walk in the door, right? Schedule Friday every day. Absolutely. Right? And Wait, especially when you're in your car. Dress for your day. If you're meeting in a bank, dress like you're meeting in a bank right? If you're working with somebody at, I don't know, Lowe's, Home Depot, Menards, right? You got to look like you're working at Home Depot. You're not wearing a three-piece suit? What? No. It's crazy, Amy. Uh, so, you know, you're, like I said, we're creating that foundation of that trust. Um, then as we go through the process, we have to identify our job seekers' needs. What do they need? And we want to make sure that those are addressed before before they get into any kind of employment, like Amy was talking about, they have transportation issues. If they have, if they, I always ask them, do you have interview clothing? If you were to get a job, do you have clothing for that? We don't know what's on, what's, what's in their plan. 
but we can always say, hey, I will always ask. I do not care. I will always ask a counselor, hey, do they have funds for this? I'll have an SNSA. Do they have funds for this? Because this is a need. Laundry? This is a need. This is a need for them. And we need to make sure that we cover this need before we get any further. Um, and the needs that OOD or the essays can't cover, sometimes we can cover and we take it on our own. We do the same thing, you know, and, and to our staff, we talk about it. And I have heard you guys talk about it in the same way is do the right thing first. Absolutely. Right. Good things will come. Funding will come. Do the right thing first. Right. If somebody needs clothes, get them clothes. If they need shoes because it's getting cold or winter boots, get the winter boots. We will pay you back. Do the right thing first. Absolutely. If even something simple like hygiene products. Yes. That's happened to us so many times where they just, they just don't have the money or they don't or they don't think about something as a necessity. So what's $20 at the end of the day? You know what I mean? To make sure this person can move forward. And that may be something small to us, but it could be huge to them. So we just wanna keep pushing forward. And if I worked for an agency, I wouldn't be able to do that. It would have to come out of my pocket all the time. And I would never even look at saying, oh, can I be reimbursed? There's no way. Yeah, we we cover those expenses well. Yeah. So in in an effort to make sure that we stay on track for time, these are a lot of the areas that we cover. And one of the big things that has been historically challenging is covering that difference between need and want, right? And I yep. use this example a lot. It is a silly example, so if you want to giggle, it's okay, right? Is that we live, work and play in Ohio, right? If somebody says, "I want to be a dolphin trainer." I want it, I want it, I want it. That's a great want, right? The need is not here. You need something more realistic, right? You need something that is more viable. Your want is an excellent hobby. It's an excellent area of interest. It's an excellent opportunity to expand your network with other people who are also interested in dolphins and just an excellent opportunity to engage in that in other places. But if you say, I need to work with dolphins, it's probably not going to happen. SeaWorld's gone. I know. Yeah. So, and the same thing that I talk with folks is I, I use myself as the example. Those of you that, there's a few of you that know me fairly well, right? Numbers are not really my thing, right? My undergrad is in English. I have a communication degree. I like words. I like people, right? Math is not really my thing, right? I am not going to be an accountant. If I said I wanted to be an accountant, I would ha really have a hard time. Right? I need to find something in my skill set. So we look at those difference between wants and needs and have honest, frank conversations about the viability of that actually happening in the area that they live. Because we want to have that service performed with dignity and integrity and not having that hard conversation isn't that. Nope. It's okay to say what you want isn't it right now. Might not be it until you move to Florida. Right? That's okay. Or those who are in retail and say, I don't want to work weekends. Mm -hmm. So this is kind of a, an abbreviated version. You can print out the slides. I know we're at about seven minutes or so until we're getting close to time. And we'll hang around to answer additional questions and things like that. But we focus on realistic goals and sustainable goals, right? Not short-term work, right? Not temp work, right? If it's seasonal, does it have the potential to turn into long-term opportunities? Unless the person needs seasonal right? A perfect example, and it's absolutely okay, is that I do holiday work in the wintertime because I love my landscaping gig in the summer, right? You can merge more than one opportunity together, and that's okay, okay? And the, the number one thing that we both do is we really want to work to break the chain of codependency, right? And the codependency is between the system and the individual, right? But if I say I don't need anything right now, right? If I say that I don't need a job coach right now and I need someone, what happens? So I'm going to say that I need them just so that they never go away, right? Or Joe, how many times have you heard it? I like you. I don't want you to go away. Oh, absolutely. All the time, right? Every the, day. Right. Yeah. That creates a system of codependency between the individual, the provider, and oftentimes the county board because OOD says you're out. Right. But the beautiful thing about OOD saying you've met your goal, you're successful, you don't need long term support, you're out, is that if something happens, 
you can come back. It's okay. Because the thing that oftentimes I find when I talk to professionals in the field is they say, but I need them to be successful. They need to be successful. I want them to be successful. Part of being successful is the freedom to fail. And you know what happens if you get fired? Nothing. You find another job. I've been fired. I haven't. Right? Oh. <laughs> well, that's he did. I like how everyone laughs like, oh, I'm sure he did. <laughs> it's okay. And that's part of helping understand real world experience, real life experiences. It's okay. If you quit, it's okay. If you do a few days and you're like, oh, crap, this isn't for me. It's okay. Part of being truly integrated, independent, and having the right to make decisions about your own life means that you have the right to mess it up because we all mess it up. I mess up all the time, every day. I make mistakes, I screw up, I forget stuff all the time. We need to help normalize that. And we need to help work with them to understand that just because they're doing well doesn't mean that that door's closed. We also talk a lot about the natural support system, right? And helping the under, uh, employer understand the natural support system. And these freedom to success equaling freedom to fail builds resiliency, right? It builds confidence. It builds sustainability within the individual. And so we wanna leave a little bit of time for questions as well, unless I forgot anything. But the number one reason that I hear when we talk to people about our model is, why did you do this? And the worst answer for me when somebody says, why do we do this this way? And the answer is, well, it's the way we've always done it. Right? Worst answer on earth, in my opinion. Right? It's okay. Our world is different. Our world is dramatically different than it was even a few years ago. Doing something different is why we're all here. So try something different. Well, I mean, like I said before, you can't keep knocking your head against the wall. Sometimes you gotta say, okay, what's going on? What do I need to do different? It's just going back to that drawing board and keep doing it. Like you said, change is eminent. And if you don't change, what happens? You don't survive. Right. We have to be adaptable. We have to look at how things change. We have to acknowledge that everything changes and that things aren't always the same old, same old. Because if you think it's always the same old, same old, then you're never going to get any kind of more results than you have right now. Right. And I think the other piece that makes a really big difference in both of our agencies is that we have a culture of authenticity. Be who you are, exactly who you are right now with everyone that you work with, with each other, with your clients, with the businesses. Don't pretend to be something you're not. Don't promise to be something you're not. And don't ask the people that you're working with to be something that they're not. You do that to family. <laughs> Only during the holidays. <laughs> <laughs> we have... Uh, I think just a couple of minutes left. So we wanna open the floor to any kind of questions that you might have. And an hour is not enough time to have the really in-depth conversation about the theory behind why we do this, but we want to show you that it can be done a different way. Um, HopeWorks is a nonprofit, correct? No, we no are, you're not. No, too you're much not red either. tape for a nonprofit. <laughs> too much red tape. Man. Yes. So the other thing that I think is important to know is that neither of our agencies are a nonprofit. So we're not out asking anybody to help cover overhead, to help cover additional staff. We are thriving and growing at incredible rates without asking for any handouts. And it can be done and your employees can be paid a wonderful wage and providing extremely beneficial services and having wonderful outcomes without having to beg, borrow, and steal. Absolutely. Thank you so much for spending Thank your you guys morning very with much us for and coming. we'll leave Appreciate some time for it. questions. Thank you. Thank you, Amy and Joe. Uh, we do have a couple minutes for questions. Yeah, Dwight. First off, I love the work that you're both doing. Thank and you. also, Amy, I wanna talk to you later about a succession plan because I want the work that you're doing to continue. And my question is this, I see that you both work in a lot of different counties. 
what challenges do you face as a result of that? And what can we do to support the work that you're doing? Do you want to go first? For me, the, the biggest challenge is the variance in billing local dollar fundings from county to county. Every county has a different structure and a different standard operating procedure for billing local funding. And that can be very frustrating and time consuming to navigate and having a universal system for that would be remarkable. I'd have to agree with her. I'd absolutely have to agree with her. And and if you have any pool when it comes to like transportation and places and counties, that would be wonderful. Yes. Uh, yes, we are. <laughs> we really are. Next year. <laughs> Laura, Sh Sean, not sure if there were any questions that came in online. No questions there. Anything Either we're else? that good or no one cares. Um, I, I did think of one question, you know, you've done an amazing job of trying to create a, a staff structure that supports the system. Um, do you have any data on how that's transferred to helping people find jobs, successful jobs, long-term placements, things like that? Is it, is it converting over to success on that side of things? Um, we don't have any specific data or anything that we've run, but I can tell you that um, we have one of the highest report cards in Cuyahoga County and that we have a very high closure rate and we have a very high rate of individuals that stay on the jobs for long periods of time. I get calls from people who've been on jobs for two years. Jennifer still gets calls from people who've been on jobs for three years. And other, our other job developers, they just call them and just say, I wanted to say, hi, how are you doing? The job's going great. You know, so we don't have any specific data because I've never thought about doing anything like that. We but I data, but admittedly, it's because my husband is a data analyst. Oh, OK, um, yeah. So I'm, I maybe have an unfair advantage in that department. Um, we do. And, and a couple of the things that we do that are, are different is we have that much smaller caseload. And so our staff are often meeting with folks more or working on their behalf more because their caseloads cap out at 15. So they're spending more time with them in the, in the first place. But we've had such rapid growth that in the last three years, we've gone from just me hanging out by myself that we have 18 folks doing job development and another five doing transition services. And so our growth projection and like our OOD scorecard looks a little tilted because we have such continued growth that we've not been able to stabilize. When we look at the staff who've been with us over time, they're um, annual placements are higher than those with higher caseloads, and they have longer longevity because they're able to make sure that that job is a better match. Mm -hmm. All right, we do have time for one last question. Jan? Um, I'm curious, what do your numbers look like between serving those in the OOD system and those through the waiver career planning and IES? I would say they're very, very comparable. They're very comparable. We um, we seem to have a very good outcome when it comes to individuals we're serving on the waiver, when it comes to placements, when it comes to um, not having to utilize so much um, follow-up afterwards. Like Amy said, we we believe, we have the motto that if it's not needed, we're not going to just take it because it's right. there, because it's taken out of the dollars that they need. And if that need appears again later, we are able to cover that. Um, but just like with our, I would say it's very comparable compared to our um, our 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 waiver services and our OOD services are very comparable. I would say they're maybe off by a couple percentage.
We do. We we live maybe I don't know 500 yards away from each other. We'll be over later. <laughs> <laughs> we'll see you for dinner. Uh, so ours is actually very different. 99% um, of our billing is OOD billing, and the reason that we do that though is because we're saving those funds for transportation, HPC assistance at home, and those types of things. We will continue to do long-term support and check in on people whether there's waiver funding or not, and so we're doing it anyway. We want them to use their waiver funding for those auxiliary services. Now, will we provide those additional services? Yes. In three years, we haven't had an identified need to where it was really, truly critical. Well, I th think I can speak for all of us, unless Bill has a really quick question. We, I was going to say that, or we can hang around after. Either is okay. Yeah, just wondering about the school age services, like when you're embedded into the classrooms, how how is that working and how did you get in? Because it can be very restrictive getting into the classroom. Yeah, we actually, all of our staff have designated space within each school building. And so they're popping in and working either within the special education classes, during homeroom. Sometimes they'll have lunch with kids or hang out. Some do after school service if their parents are picking them up. So it is customized in the same way that job development or any other services, but our staff are embedded just like any other school staff member. We do an MOU, but their, their salaries are funded through the service that they're providing. All right. Well, uh, I think I can speak for all of us in saying that this was really informative and uh, gave everyone lots of information to take back with them. So uh, please join me with one last thank you for Joe and Amy.